Welcome to NAFA's Advisor Today podcast series, where we focus on how financial advisors work, live, and give to their local communities and our greater financial services industry. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi, everyone. This is Chris Gandy, one of your co-hosts for Advisor Today's podcast with my wonderful, with my other better half, Suzanne Kirwan. Suzanne, how are you? I'm doing great, Chris. Great to be here. Suzanne, I'm so thankful that you are our co-host because now with you leading membership and you leading all these wonderful things with NAFA, we are able to really take this to the next level. So before we get going today on today's podcast, can you share with us who our sponsor is today? Yeah, so we're really delighted to have uh, Life Happens as our sponsor. Maybe you've gotten a message, maybe you haven't heard, but Life Happens is now part of NAFA along with the Society of Financial Service Professionals, where Chris and I are actually both down in Jacksonville, Florida today, coming live at you um, from that kind of merger. And so Life Happens is the consumer arm now of NAFA, really putting education out to consumers about the value of life insurance, the value of disability income insurance, among others. And if you're not aware, February is Insure Your Love Month. We're just a few days away from that. It's also I Love NAFA Month. So we're making sure that everybody out there knows that you can get free resources from Life Happens to put in front of your clients and prospective clients to help educate them and create demand for you. And of course, that demand for you can be found on uh, both Life Happens Find an Advisor as well as NAFA's Find an Advisor. And all of our active members are proudly profiled there so the consumers can say, gosh, you're right, I should get life insurance and immediately find an ethical advisor with whom to work. So we're excited to have Life Happens on board and celebrate and share your love and I love NAFA month in just a few short days. Thank you, Suzanne. Well, with no further ado, we're always happy to come together. And you mentioned the fact that we're down at um, part of FSP. Um, who is now part of the NAFA family. And they do some things a little differently um, than what we've done, but one of of their national meetings and one of their most attended meetings in person is the one we're at called the FSP Institute, which will be part of NAFA's ongoing education and opportunity. So those out there, pay attention to that. It's a great summit, and uh, we want to make sure people next year attend this elaborate, this fantastic summit and, and and continue to grow their practices and, and personally themselves. So with that being said, Suzanne, you want to introduce our co-host, or I'm sorry, not our co-host, trash that, our, our guest for today. Um, would you go ahead and introduce our guest today and we'll get going. I'm delighted to introduce Frank Maselli. And so I'll tell you the little backstory of Frank and I. So I met Frank. So we have a wonderful partner named White Love. If you're not familiar with White Glove, um, they do seminars and they do webinars and they do lead generation. There is, I didn't mean to do a commercial for them, but I love them so much. I will. And then Frank, you can, you can chime in. The thing I think, and it creates demand. So it's right to consumers. They do all the marketing. Advisors pay nothing up front. It's such a no brainer. You only pay for the people that actually show up and the leads that you have for people that registered. So it's a no brainer for associate for, um, excuse me, for advisors. So we're working out with them in our partner network. So long story short, White Glove is phenomenal. They've got phenomenal people. It's founded and started by advisors who are still in production um, and, and are NAFA members. So they hold something that they have an event each year called Host You that brings in many advisors to talk about how they can do a better job in running seminars in advance to create more wealth for themselves and to get more clients covered. And Frank Maselli was one of the keynote speakers at the event. And I got an opportunity and a guy named Andrew Saxa is at Reminder Media, another great partner. Again, Reminder Media does custom magazines for advisors. You can send it out a great way to keep in touch and to do prospecting. If the members get a discount, of course. So Andrew Sachs at Reminder Media takes me by the shirt like he holds on to me and he drags me into the main room and he says, Frank's about to speak. We have to meet Frank. We can't miss Frank. And I was like, you know, I don't know Frank Maselli. Like he's that's not a nor- name we normally hear in the NAFA world. So and I was spellbound. I was like, this guy is great. We got to invite him into the podcast. He was already on my list to call. And then lo and behold, Frank Maselli decides on his own to join NAFA, comes into the family in the fold. And now he is actually um, really helping us with what we call triangle team. 
which is one of our, our most engaged members at NAFA. And so Frank is going to do two master classes with them. And he is the best selling author of multiple books and a renowned speaker. So with no further ado, Frank, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. That's a funny story, by the way. Andrew's a, <laughs> a real character. <laughs> is it, so he, Frank, every, the, everybody needs an Andrew. That's right. So, sure. so, so Frank, the real question I'm sure all the NAFA members want to know is how do they get a microphone like that, where they can basically, I mean, they, you look like a, you know, a little bit of Harry Curious there uh, with a little bit. Of, I'm from Chicago. So, you know, he had the microphone with his name on it and a one, a two. So, um, no, Frank, we're so happy that you are um, connected to NAFA and that you speak the truth about the industry. And, and we look forward to having this conversation. So, so, Frank, tell us a little bit about your backstory, how you got started in the industry and how you got started with um, the idea of kind of marketing, because obviously you're doing some marketing things that are a little different than what I would say the traditional advisor has been taught to do. Sure, sure. Well, I started about 40 years ago with a company called Dean Witter. Um, Dean, Dean Witter got bought by Sears and they hired a truckload of rookie stockbrokers and stuck us all in Sears stores, if you can believe that. I, I remember that. I do. See, remember. See, not, yeah. Not too many people go back that far. Not not to date to... myself, but yes, I remember that. Yes. It's okay. It's okay. So yeah, I started as a as a retail stockbroker in a wirehouse and uh built a business, became a manager, kind of rose through the ranks and ended up uh running a mutual fund family in Boston for about ten years. That was a great experience. So a little bit of buy side, a little bit of sell side experience. And then I said, I just want to do my own thing. And um I retired, quote unquote, retired, and that lasted about three days until my wife threw me out of the house. And so I, I've been doing training and coaching and speaking and writing for the last probably twenty years now. It's been it's been quite a journey, a lot of fun. Very much. So 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 tell us a little bit about your books. Sure, sure. First book was called Seminars: The Emotional Dynamic. Uh, I, I built my business on seminars. I, I found seminars. I was very, very lucky. I found seminars early in my career and did a whole bunch of them. Um, I, I tallied them up several years ago, and I did over 4,000 public seminars and um, loved doing them, absolutely loved public speaking, and I think it's a fantastic way to grow a business. Uh, people are dying for education uh, they need help really, really badly. And if you can, if you can speak to the public in some intelligent way, not only can you build a gigantic business, but you can have so much fun doing it. It's just such a passion, um, and it's just a turn on. So that was my first book. Then I wrote a book on referrals, which I think is the second probably best way to grow a business. Um, I, I think there's a real problem in our industry when it comes to referrals. The techniques were born 80 years ago. And we're still using these heavy-handed sales techniques. So that's out, new stuff. So that's great. And then I wrote a book for younger advisors called 40 Tips for the Under 40 Advisor because there's so many young people coming into this business and they need to know uh, some, some things that will help them get off to a good start and avoid some of the incredibly stupid mistakes that we make early in our careers. So hopefully that'll help. But yeah, just just three books. I'm writing the the final edition of the seminar book as we speak. It's on my other screen right here as I'm as I'm talking to. You. It's going to be the penultimate, uh, the actual ultimate edition of the seminar story. So it'll be a lot of fun. So you so, got into seminars even when you were like a Dean Witter Sears retail stockbroker. Absolutely, uh, I used to oh. do them at Sears. Believe it or not, oh. Sears, every Sears store, ha and Sears is gone now, which is so hard to get your mind around. Uh, every Sears store had a training room, and I used to go into the training room and, and do the employees. I used to have all the employees would come in, or, you know, on their break or, okay, or right. off out. And that's where I started. And then I started doing uh, Lions Club, Moose, Elk, Kiwanis, Rotary. Um, so a lot of free stuff. And then I started doing my own things, paying for my own seminars. And that's, you know, the dinner stuff and the, the, the direct mail and all that, the Ruth's Chris and 
Yeah. I think oh. Ruth's Chris has a statue of me somewhere in their headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> Black card member of Ruth's Chris. You've done that many dinner summoners. Sure. So, so Frank, let's 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 rewind the tape a little bit. So, um, talk to me as if ninety percent of America's fear is speaking in front of people, right? Mm-hmm. Let's 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 put the right, and they and they 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 fear saying something wrong. They fear the idea of standing in front of someone and being analyzed. What would you say to someone that their response would be? Well, you know, that's probably not for me because you know, I don't really like talking in front of people. Mm-hmm. Well, a couple of things. First of all, I think the financial advisory profession self-selects out of that fear. Uh, generally speaking, financial professionals are very good communicators. We're probably the top communicating profession out there, or at least among them. So I don't think that applies generally to financial advisors, but if you are generally scared of speaking there's there's a couple of things you can do. There are ways to overcome that, um, but frankly, you don't have to. I mean, there's no mandatory reason that you have to do seminars. If if it genuinely scares you to speak in public, I think that's worth analyzing. But I I also am a very big believer in not doing stuff that causes you pain. So if public speaking causes you pain, then seminars may not be your path. And there are there are at least fifty other ways to grow a business and you don't need to cause yourself that anxiety. But I don't think financial professionals in general suffer from that kind of a fear that the general public has. And that is a very big fear among the general public. But we're kind of a, we're a unique profession. We love to talk and we're pretty good yeah. at it for the most part. Mm-hmm. I like to educate. Yeah. So I think the, the, I think the people, at least what I see is that the finance, what I've kind of surveyed, financial service professionals don't go the seminar speaking route because they don't want to do all the rigmarole, right? They just want to show up, (laughs) which is great. And then, and you know, they're the talent when that makes sense because, you know, you put that together and somebody else takes care of the rigmarole and you show up as a talent, you kill it, right? Makes total sense. Right. Right. That's, that's actually where White Glove came to my attention. I, I I had an advisor who I had coached before and he called me up and he said, you got to talk to these White Glove people. I said, what are they doing? He goes, well, the first thing is you don't pay for mail. You just pay for the people who show up. And I said, well, what if nobody shows up? And he says, well, then you don't pay. I said, no, no, that can't be right. That that makes I mean, how many times at Ruth's Chris was I standing in the door and the rain is coming down and there's three people in the room and I got 40 steak dinners standing there. So, so I couldn't believe that. But yeah, they, they took all that fear away and that really turned me on to their process, which is exciting. So, so, Frank, are you are you still doing seminars currently now? Uh, f- for the public, very little. Uh, okay. I, I only talk really to advisors uh, at this point. Some advisors will bring me in to do special guest, you know, guest appearance at their seminar, uh, so, but very little to the public. It's it's ninety nine percent of what I do is only advisor coaching and training now. So, so in your pride, let's rewind the tape. In your pride. How many seminars were you doing on a monthly basis, do you think? Uh, 40. 40? Yeah, probably 40. 40. I, I, at my peak, I was doing probably six, seven seminars a week at least. Um, and then then uh, at one point, I was a wholesaler. I became a wholesaler. Um, and I started, and then when I was a manager, I did a lot of seminars. So I was probably doing 40 a month at that point. Yeah, so 40, so, so 40 a month. So, so let's just, I'm going to dissect that a little bit because I, yeah. I'm, I'm a volume guy and I do a Good. lot of volume and, and, and I understand the power of numbers. Um, and Nick Murray's, and Nick Murray's book um, is great, right? Um, yeah. About numbers. So it's, you know, it's, the numbers are the numbers, right? Um, and numbers win. So, but let's, um, let's dial it back just a little. That means that you have to be a masterful tactician of time management and your schedule, right? Sure. Um, if you're able, if you're capable of pulling that off on a weekly basis, because there's people that come from the seminars and there's follow up with people that come from the seminars, and then there's actually meetings that come from the seminars. So you're not just going to a seminars. There's all the pieces that go along with that. So what would you? What would you tell someone about their time management skill if they're going to go this route? 
Well, yeah, a, a very good question. And first of all, a lot of the seminars that I did were for other advisors. So I didn't have that follow-up issue. Um, I was not the one doing the end of, you know the meetings after the seminar. Uh, I, I would be setting the stage for that advisor. So as a wholesaler, they're not doing they're not opening accounts with me. They'd be opening accounts with you as the advisor. So let's put that in context. My my time was uh, I was busy, but I was busy speaking. I wasn't busy managing money, and I wasn't busy necessarily doing appointments and coaching clients at that point. So. Um, but yeah, you're right. T it does take time. It takes a tremendous amount of time. Follow up is ten times more difficult than the actual presentation. Um, you know, you really—that's where you make or break your business—is in the follow up. Follow up is very difficult. Uh, but you know, also you're saying ahead. a really good, a really good lead generation model, right? Get the talent, get the senior person in there, just doing the seminar, and all the people down the line from you, right? Get them really good at doing all the follow up and the appointment setting. I, I think it can work. I, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it can work. But think about it the uh, slightly different way. The audience bonds to the speaker. And uh, as an advisor, you want to be able to do at least some, if not most, of the speaking yourself. Um, most advisors do it all themselves. So it's kind of a the hybrid model is a little unique. But uh, you, you can really, really have a tremendous business explosion if you get good at seminars. It, it's just mind-boggling the numbers that I've seen in my career, what people can do if they're good, if they're good. If they're not, then they struggle and they spend a lot of money wastefully. So. Right. So what are what are tips to get the audience bonded to the speaker? Do you have some oh, tips there, little life hacks a, we, can, we can use? Well, I mean, uh, the, the the subtitle of my book is The Emotional Dynamic. There are nine emotions that you have to hit during a presentation. And if you mm -hmm. hit all nine of these emotions, because seminars are an emotional process. We use a lot of logic and statistics and stuff, you know, in a presentation, but the audience doesn't connect with any of that. They don't even understand half the stuff that you say to them. What they understand is how they feel and how they, how you make them feel. Uh -huh. So, you know, the, we, the, the nine emotions, there's an acronym for the nine emotions. It's kind of a comedy. The, the acronym is Lurch Face. You got to get people to like you, understand, respect. You create confidence. You want to make them happy. Lurch, L-U-R-C-H. Face is fear. And fear is complicated because you're not there to scare people. Scaring people is old school and that doesn't work anymore. And, and it's not ethical in my opinion. I don't think you need to scare people or you should be doing that. But you have to understand fear because they're coming in scared. And then action, change, and enthusiasm. So those are the nine emotions. If you hit all nine of them, your your appointment ratio will be well north of 75, 80%. You'll set appointments with everybody in that room. They will bond to you um, more powerfully than you can imagine because they really do want help. They want help. They want to believe in somebody. So it's kind of exciting. Lurch. Face. It's an action. Lurch face. Yeah, right? Okay. Hashtag lurch face. That, yeah, so, 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 Frank, what is the name? So, so is that in the last book or that's the one that's on the shelf now and that's still, that's the one still cooking? No, well, no. The, the one I'm writing is the fifth edition of that book. It's called Seminars the Emotional Dynamic. It's been out for 20 years. So, it's, uh, okay. yeah, we started with that a long time ago. Um, but, but the latest one will be the last book I write on this subject. It's going to be, massive it'll be a lot of fun masterpiece so, so those those people who are who are who are, let's say they're not great readers frank mm. um let's say they're they're like you know what i, I want to do this it's something I, i've always had an interest in doing sure um i'm going to give frank's book but if frank's book looks like the bible you know i'm gonna scam <laughs> i'm gonna skim over it and you know i mean i'm speaking from the advisor out here okay so, you know that are like you know, we live in a world of immediate gratification, right? And we live in this world where Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and, you know, the immediate gratification space, right? And, you know, they click a button and all of a sudden you get three solutions, right? Um, the seminar business is a little different than that because the immediate gratification isn't right there. So what would you say to a new generation advisor or those people who have said, you know, Frank, I know a lot of advisors. I'll give you an example. I know that after COVID, there's 50% of the advisors that say they never want to see a client again. Mm. They're, 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 
they're this screen has become the new barrier to success, right? And so what would you say to advisors who say, oh, I'm going to be a hundred percent virtual or I'm going to be a hundred percent, you know, um, direct mail or whatever it may be digital or, or, you know, what would you say to that? And what advice would you give someone in that space? I think you can be successful digitally. Um, and I did, you, you dropped out there for a minute. So I hope I didn't miss a big chunk of your question, but um, I think you can be successful with virtual workshops and with virtual communication. I think we prove that to ourselves. As an industry, we pivoted almost overnight to virtual and it saved our industry. So that was a wonderful transition. You cannot make the same connection with a virtual audience that you can with a live audience. That's just a fact. There's no, there's no power on earth that will help you make that same level of personal connection. Can't be done. If you're going to do virtual, um, you need to understand a couple of things. First of all, it's 10 times harder than it looks. Uh, sure. You think it's really easy to to do, and it's absolutely not easy to do. <laughs> the, the, the second thing is you've got to do certain things during the presentation that keep the audience engaged because while you're talking to them, they're looking at their other screen and they're doing stuff like this. They're multitasking. And so you really do have to to energize. And with virtual, it's all the flow of energy is all one direction. The speaker gets nothing back from the audience. There's no, I can't tell what people are thinking or, or if they're following me or if they're laughing when I make a joke. So it's a tremendous pressure. There are only a very few handful of advisors that I've seen who are good virtually. Now, can you communicate with clients one on one? Absolutely. It's a totally viable medium. And and virtual makes geography go away. I can work with clients in Indonesia. Uh -huh. um, I did a seminar with 5,000 financial advisors in India. H how would that be possible without a virtual, you know, virtual world? So you're right. It it does work, but it's it's definitely more difficult than you think. Wow. 5,000 advisors yeah. And you're in front of them. Yeah, just like just I'm curious. sitting, just like I am with you right here, 5,000 yeah. on the other end. I'm curious, Frank, what's the first thing you say to them? Because they're all skeptical, right? When they, when they come to the room, they're coming in like, who's this guy? What the hell? Why is he in this? You know, they might have heard your speaking. They might have heard the fact that you got a book out. Okay. That's okay. But what are you, yeah, what are you saying to capture that audience, because I do a lot of public speaking myself. Mm -hmm. um, I speak at national forums, medical forums, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I'm speaking probably two, three times a, a month in front of large audiences. Um, but I know they say within a lot of the public speaking pros say in the first 30 seconds, seconds you're the first, first two, two to three minutes, you got to capture their imagination. Right. And so what are you saying to them in that first snippet of time so that they're engaged and open to what your message is going to be? Well, that, that was a very challenging uh, program, I have to admit, because, you know, there's a gigantic cultural divide um, mm. and there's a language divide to a great degree. And, you know, obviously, so I, I did a little homework and I, I did a little research. And I think if I remember correctly, the first thing I said to them was they are on the cusp of growth. And, and if you look at the statistics, it's really quite staggering what they're going to go through. They are where our industry was 45 years ago. They are about to experience a growth cycle in their financial services profession that is going to dwarf anything we have ever imagined here in the U.S. And we've gone through a major growth cycle, and we're going through another one now. But they're, they're doing it on a scale that is unprecedented. Um, and so I, I kind of, I think I remember saying something like, get ready for the greatest ride of your lives, greater than you can ever imagine. And here, and my, my thesis was, here are some techniques you can use to, to make sure that that's a very successful experience for you. But the, the statistics... Um, and the experience they are going through in India uh, is mind-boggling. It's you can't you can't even understand it in, in American standards, but uh -huh. um, it's pretty it's pretty exciting. Their industry is growing like crazy. All right, Frank, let's 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 pivot. Um, you're on obviously 
NAFA, NAFA's advisor today's podcast. So tell me, how did you find NAFA? How did you find the National Association of Insurance and Financial Services? How did you find the oldest advocate industry or advocate association that represents insurance, insurance and financial services? How did you find us? I, I met Suzanne at the meeting. Um, I, I had Thank heard you of me down as a referral. I don't know. I need I, some credit. <laughs> I, I thought I did. I thought I put that on the thing. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and I, I mean, I had heard of NAFA for a long time, but I, I really didn't know what you guys did. I never paid much attention to it. And, and then I think the presentation at the white glove meeting just woke me up and I'm like, yeah, okay, we, we better, we better get involved. I mean, there's a gigantic legislative risk in our yeah. profession. You've got these politicians. They're just, uh, I don't know what they're thinking, but they have no clue what's going on in the financial world. They really don't. They think they do, but they don't. And so I think NAFA as, as an advocacy organization is, is helping that process. You know, let's educate these people so they don't make bad policy. Right. Uh, one, one bad policy can screw a hundred million retirees. And, and, you know, that's the, we've got to prevent that. So um, that's why I, I joined right away, like the next day after the meeting, I think I signed up. You did. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. Susanna, whoever, whoever did the presentation obviously hit the lurch face, right? right. <laughs> I know. I, you know, that's I should right. ask, Frank, I should have, Frank, I should have asked you for feedback on my presentation, but we're going to have to do that in the future. And it's so the lurch face thing do you actually almost use that as a scorecard for advisors when you're coaching them? You do. You yeah. just said like, like what's your lurch face score? Uh, yeah. I I, what what is it. your emotional, what's your emotional score? We have an emotional scorecard that we, uh, we grade. I, I watch videos. I mean, I'll do three video analyses per day and I do a complete um, oh, emotional really? analysis okay. of people's video stuff. Okay. So. All right, Chris, we got to send in our stuff, send in our uh, film. So, 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 so Frank, what is what would you say is one of the biggest challenges that advisors go through as they start to speak in public right you know because i've met advisors that want to dwarf people with um how much they know mm -hmm. but we've all been told they don't they, you know people don't you don't care how much you know until they know how much you care right and so but I, I've seen advisors that 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 they know, you know, what I call the intellectual derelicts. They're so smart. They want the person to know that they're so smart, mm -hmm. but they forgot, they forget to connect emotionally with real stories and real things that people can grasp on, taking that complicated concept and making it so it's every day and they understand it. What is the biggest obstacle that advisors go through with trying to 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 connect the dots and mistakes that they make that you see regularly. And you're like, there it is. There it is. It's like I play basketball. And in basketball, you know, when you see – you shoot a basketball and you see someone's elbow go out like this, they're going to miss 90% of their shots. And the reason why they're going to miss 90% of their shots is because this technique here, the ball spins like this instead of the ball spinning like this. And because the ball spins like this, when it catches the rim, it has a like a reverse – angle and it sticks to the rim and every time when you see it you're like okay that person is probably not going to make the majority of their shots and it's it just is what it is no matter how many times you shoot it doesn't matter it's just the way the ball bounces no pun intended so what are some <laughs> of the techniques that you see when you analyze video and i'm sure you watch other speakers too not just the sure. speakers you're coaching but you know when you're look watching speeches i would hate for you to be in the crowd Suzanne, and I'm doing a speech, and he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, exactly. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Teachers in the audience, right? He did that. Um, <laughs> what are some of the common mistakes you see that advisors make? Let me just sum that up. What are some of the common mistakes you see advisors make over and over and over and over again that you're like, ah, uh, that's it's kind of taboo. They, they've got to adjust that. What are some of the sure. ones that you see numerous ones that are being made? Great question. And I didn't know that about basketball. I, I'm, my daughter played basketball and she was the worst basketball player in the world. And so we, we, it was just fun to watch her. She was fearless. But um, two, two biggest mistakes that I, I think come to mind immediately. One is too much information. The, the seminars that, that we, we tend to do, um, they're, just, they're just so jammed with data 
and statistics and uh, the, the the slides are horrible. They're just really, really hard to see. And and this and the presenter, the the advisor thinks they've got a hit on all those points. The audience can only absorb a certain amount of information. And so what I try to do is I try to get the advisors to understand, look, give me three things. Tell me three things that I need to know. If it's taxes, if it's estate planning, if it's retirement, whatever the subject is, break it down into three pieces that I can digest and then just drill those again and again. I was an army officer before becoming an advisor. And so we learned how to give briefings briefly. <laughs> you know, it was tight. Boom, boom, boom. Here's the three things. This is the mission we have to accomplish. So number one mistake is too much information and not enough focus. The second mistake, and this is a tough one, the second mistake is too much of a commercial. If you, The more you talk about yourself in a workshop, the less the audience likes you, the less they will bond to you. You need to talk about yourself a little bit, but if you make the whole thing a commercial, if you make every story about how you did something great for a client and how you're so smart and all that, th they tune out to that. So give them value with no strings attached. Do a little bit of a commercial. Let the, let the message carry that they can be successful with or without you. That's an interesting concept right there. Uh -huh. Most people don't understand that. Empower them to be successful and they will attach the feeling of self-confidence to you as the advisor. They will bond to you. Um, but you've, so, you've also yeah, put I'm the sorry. choice into their hands, right? I love mm -hmm. that. So they can be successful whether or not, you know, whatever they do. But if they choose you, it's their choice. Now they're bought in. They've got a stake in the ground. That's 100%. Perfectly, perfectly stated. I, I tell a very quick story. I, I had a contractor come to my house to do some repair work. He was great. We talked a lot about a project that I wanted to do myself, a bookshelf that I wanted to build. I wanted to work with wood, right? He helped me tremendously. He showed me everything I needed to do. He said, you can use my tools. Here's the wood you need to buy. He showed me everything. I hired him to do the bookshelf. <laughs> and he said, wait a minute. I just showed you how to do all that stuff. You can do it entirely yourself. I said, no, no. What you showed me is that you're a professional and I want this done correctly. But now I have confidence in you. You made me feel confident, but that confidence transfers directly to you. So I, I think that's something that a lot of advisors lack, but not all of them. Some advisors, I got to say, some of these guys are guys and gals, okay? Oh, and by the way, not, not to pander here, but this is the golden age of the female financial advisor. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have entered a, a, a phase, and it'll be with us for the next hundred years. Where if you are a, a woman advisor now, this is the time to go pedal to the metal. I mean, this is unbelievable. The demographics are staggering. Uh, the success curve for female advisors is just absolutely mind-boggling. Um, so they need to be out there as, as active and as assertive as they possibly can right now. We just need so more. <laughs> yeah, Suzanne, that's, you, know what's, you, know, you know, Suzanne, that's interesting. He says that because... Um, about four years ago when I looked at our lineup of advisors at our firm and I compared it to what I call the big three, right? I came from a firm, you know, the big, the big mutuals. I came from there and there were like spotty, you know, uh, uh, one female here or somebody who's related to someone here or someone here who was a successful attorney that then decided to be financial services, old trust doctor, but it was, it was far fewer in between. And I looked at my team and my team was 60% women. And they're like, why? And I said something to them. I said, because they have empathy we don't have. They they can do things that we can't do. And once they're committed, not interested, once they're committed to something, unlike us, our ego breaks pretty easily. <laughs> uh, they're like, nope, I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to stick to it. So it was really interesting to see that. So, so Frank... You're, you're, you're bringing light to, I think, a need that we talk about when we talk about the inclusion and the opportunity space. When we try to grow our practices, the types of people that we recruit to the industry, because there is a there's an opportunity for growth. And so uh, thank you for that, because I'm a big proponent of, of it's, it's better for everyone when we have unique individuals and 
and, and individuals with different perspectives on the way money operates. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so Frank, let's, let's, let's fast forward the tape. What's your days like now? So what do you do now? I mean, you've been in the industry how long? If you don't mind me asking. 40 years. Yeah. 40 years. Yeah. So you probably started, I don't know if you started when they still had rate cards. Right. And uh, you had to go and you had to, I don't know if you were in that space because I, I hear the stories from John Wheeler and some of the guys are like, I had rate cards. I had a card here and I had to figure it out. They wanted a hundred dollars of insurance. So I had to go because, you know, but how different is the industry now? Well, let me ask a couple questions. How different yeah. is the industry now than it was when you started? Um, very different. I, I didn't start on the insurance side. I, I, I'm sorry to say that I know virtually nothing about insurance. I, I definitely come from the stockbroker world, and and that that world has changed enormously. So yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it, it's been a radical shift. We went, we're we you know we used to be a commission sales business, and we're not a sales business anymore. Uh, this is not a sales profession anymore. Uh, we are a service profession. We are psychiatrists who happen to talk about money occasionally. Um, that's what I think of the financial world completely. But yeah, it's changed a lot in some ways, in other ways, not so much. I mean, this is still a people business. This is still a business where, uh, you know, you don't need big muscles. You don't need a, a PhD. You, you know, you don't, you, you can succeed tremendously if you've got some people skills and if you care about people. Um, that's, that I think is the biggest, the biggest thing is that, we, we really are um, a profession about caring and taking care of people. And if you have that attitude, uh, I think you'll do very, very well in this profession going forward. Um, and, and that's what's crazy. I think that is the most, that's exactly right. All the people we know that are super successful, regardless of the, whatever side they're coming from, insurance side, you know, security side, it doesn't matter. It's the ability to be in that service culture. And yet so much of financial services like skips over that until like you've already made it. You know what I mean? Like they're focusing on the illustrations and the numbers and the, and I think a lot of people, especially women, probably don't go into the industry because one, they don't know how to get in there. And two, I think the perception is that everything is like boiler room and stockbroker world. And it's it's like if they started with the, we need empathetic people who love people and want to see people thrive, there'll be a better calling card to help recruit in. Yeah. That's so Frank, let me let me Frank, let yeah. me let me let me just go back to that though. So yeah. so so I want to go back to that just for a second. So I love the idea you didn't come from the insurance world. So you haven't been tainted. Okay. So <laughs> so you didn't come from that space. That's a good thing. But my point is that when someone was a stockbroker before, you knew what they did, right? They were a stockbroker, right? They didn't do insurance, they didn't do investments. They didn't do investment fee-based planning. They didn't do uh, banking. They didn't do... And now the world, it's hard for a consumer to understand the differences between uh, yeah, Frank, true. who was a stockbroker, Chris Gandy, who's a financial advisor, and the insurance advisor who does sometimes investments. And then they walk into a bank and the bank says, you know what? At the end of the day, I understand we're we're your banking business, but we have this channel over here. If you have more than fifty thousand dollars, we'd love to give you advice. And now you've got coming into our space the robo advisor, right? The advisor that just basically is going off of algorithms, saying, "Hey, we're cheaper than actually having someone who helps you." So, from where you came from, and now you look at this this crowded elevator of space giving people financial advice share with me your perspective because i'm very interested in your perspective of that and i'm sure nathan nation is too um you've got the ears of how many did we say yesterday suzanne how many how many members across the nation that either have are with nafa or have been with nafa you've got the ears and and we are one of the voice and channels and outlets for of nafa but i'd love to get your perspective on kind of where we are because it's convoluted. It's hard for, I've heard this from numerous people, even clients and perspective. It's hard to understand who to trust, who to go to, because there's so much information and everybody offers the same thing. It's like kind of the space, but I'd love to get your perspective. So I know that's a long dated question, but it just kind of wanted to set that up. So you, so you had perspective and narrative of where I was coming from. 
Yeah, no, I, I think you're 100% correct. This has become a very, very confusing world for the average consumer, quote unquote, or a client. Uh, they don't they don't really know who they can rely upon. And and that's a little scary. I, I think, you know, uh, the, the days of the, the stockbroker are probably over. Those days are gone. Now you're talking about people who, who will manage money for a fee. So the buying and the selling and the transactions, those transactions are gone. Uh, I don't think anybody needs to fear transactional business anymore. Okay, so so that's a good thing. There's no more churning. There's no more, you know, slamming them into stocks and all that nonsense. That's gone, and that's made our industry a lot better. Um, but but you have entire subsets of the industry. For example, look at the wirehouses. These are gigantic firms with with trillions and trillions of dollars of assets. Yet very few of them do insurance, for example. And one of the biggest needs that people have is for insurance. Okay, so. How, so now you're a client, you're a, you're a you're a person, you're a human, a civilian, we'll call you. And you now, who do you go to? What do you need? So on one hand, you need a separate person for insurance, or do you? Can your financial advisor do insurance? You're not sure where to go. Long story short, in the midst of all this confusion, uh, it's gotten a lot better for clients because they can find people who who can solve multiple problems for them. There are many advisors out there who can do a lot of things together. And to be a holistic financial professional, I think that's the future. Um, I don't think we can be as compartmentalized and as siloed as we used to be because clients don't want six or seven different advisors. They kind of want one person they can trust or one team they can trust. And that's another big trend is teams. Teams are a big thing. So. Uh, you might have four or five people or more on a team. And so I've got an insurance expert. I've got a an annuity expert. I've got an estate planning attorney as part of my team. And now we can solve all your problems for you. And that's a very, I think, a positive trend for the industry. So, But at the end of the day, it all comes down to trust, a trusting relationship with somebody who you believe has your best interests at heart, and who has the expertise to solve multiple problems for you. And I think our industry's gotten a lot better at that. So Frank, what I heard you say, and I just want to make sure, you know, NAFA Nation heard that is, is we have to be nimble <laughs> enough and skilled enough to understand that we, we have to be able to know multiple things at some sort of depth. You mentioned the three things that, hey, tell me the three things, tell me the three things, tell me the three things. It's funny because I always tell people when they are interviewing me and I'm interviewing them to see if they want to become a client. So they say, so what do you do? I said, I, I really do three things. One, I help people make smart decisions with money. Vanilla. <laughs> Two, I help them protect the things they care about the most. And three, I make sure longevity wise, they can leave the world a little better than they found it. That's where legacy comes from in our name. And I shut up. And that's, that's it. Beautiful. And people are like, I want to be a part of that. <laughs> right? And uh, and, yeah. and they're like, well, I'm making this. Because every because if you think about it, isn't everything we do, by the way, Nifa Nation, don't use my stuff. I'm just kidding. It's, it's, it's all borrowed and repurposed. <laughs> it's good stuff. But, you should steal it. Like <laughs> but 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 it's it's true. Everything we talk about at the end of the day, are we make, helping to make wiser more educated decisions with the money that they have, right? Or the money they inherit or the money in which they are repurposing or whatever it may be, right? And so I've dialed it down to that to make, you know, I can do a 30 second commercial or a 60 second commercial, but at the end of the day, they heard those three things. Okay, yes, I need someone to help me make decisions. Two, I, you know, I wanna make sure that everything's taken care of, don't have to worry. And three, if I could do it with some efficiency and leave, leave a little something behind, be with the world of better and yeah, I wanna do that because no one's helped me think through that. You know, it's just kind of just simplistic stuff. Because we were all molded into these soldiers with the red letter. Remember the red letter language? They gave it to us and said, memorize this. And then everybody would say the same thing. And then you would basically, I was like, there's no differences between us all. So I'm going to be a little different. So I, I kind of learned that along the way. And you're saying a lot of the same thing is the ability to connect early and be able to connect emotionally. And once you're able to do that, they'll trust you with everything. I've always said, if people can trust you, if they trust you, they'll trust you with their kids. If they trust you. 
if they don't trust you, then, you know, you can have the greatest product in the world. They're never going to do business with you. Right? Yeah. Your ability to, to build that. So, so Frank, share with us a little bit. Are you doing podcasts now? Are you doing just the books? Are you, um, you mentioned the fact that, yes, you're coaching. If I wanted to get coached by the Frank Maselli, is that something that NAFA advisors have an opportunity to do? Or, I mean, or is, or I have to find you on the internet. I mean, how does, I mean, share with us a little bit about sure. kind of how we, how do we find and connect with you? Sure. Uh, I've tried to make it as easy as possible. I mean, I'm a one man shop. So I, I coach, um, I charge an hourly fee. There are no contracts. I am not a fan of coaching contracts. Um, and I know I don't want to trash any coaches out there, but it's extremely lucrative to be a coach when you have somebody on the couch for two or three years. Okay. I have no interest in doing that. If I can't help you in two or three phone conversations, then I'm not the guy for you. Okay. I'm a very action oriented coach. You call me, it's, it's an hourly fee. Um, and it's, it's basically customized around the advisor. After 40 years in this business, I, I've seen so many ways to succeed that there is no Maselli way. You mu- there's no Maselli program that you've got to sign up for. There's, every, there's a thousand different ways to succeed. I'm going to help you find your way to succeed and make you the best you you can possibly be. And then, you know, and then we move on. Some people in, in the beginning of a relationship, maybe we talk weekly and then it slows down and then it goes away. And that's perfect. That's what I want. I want you to go away. I'm happy, you know, successful. And then we talk once a year and that's great. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm easy though. It's very, it's very easy. It's very customized to do a lot of seminar coaching. I watch videos every day. People send me their videos. Um and then uh, I do a lot of writing, and uh, that's about it. It's a lot of fun. So, um, prior to doing the seminar, are you coaching them? Are they walking through the seminar with you, saying, "Frank, let me give you. I'm going to tape my seminar. No audience. Tell me what you think." And then they're going. You know, I played sports, and one of the things we used to do is we used to watch film. Yeah. Right. And film is. Is is the best thing about film is it's 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 real life. It happens in the moment where you have to perform. Um, the worst thing about film is it's happening at the moment in which you have to perform. Right? Yeah, you, you, can't, can't, you, you capture you, you that moment forever. You can't yeah. hide, right? Yeah, so right. the things that you're not good at, and the and the, and the mistakes, they show up. They show up wildly, and they show up live, right? And so. Are you coaching them that way or are they going out doing the seminar and they're just sending you videos of them actually doing that seminar? Yeah, th- th- that's a great point. I mean, the best thing that somebody could do is work with me before they go live because it would save them a whole bunch of trouble. Right. Most, I, I would say most people don't do that. Most people, they do a seminar, they'll do a workshop, they get very bad results and then they go, oh, I need help you know, before I spend another $10,000 on this stuff. So then they come to me and we, and we tweak it and we, we make changes. But the best thing that could happen, if somebody thinks they want to do this, let's talk before you go live, you know, before you hit Broadway, let's play in Poughkeepsie and let's see how you're doing. (laughs) No, basically that's what it comes down. Let, you know, it's like a scrimmage. I mean, Chris, you know, this. let's scrimmage first and then we'll go live. You're going to have the dress rehearsal before you have the performance, right? It makes sense. But in the practice, yeah, I mean, mo- yeah. but the the problem is ego. Most advisors think they're really, really good, and interestingly, many of them are. I mean, m- many advisors are naturally gifted speakers, and I, you know, so can I shave five strokes off your game? No, no. But can I take one stroke off your game? Yeah. And when you're really good, one stroke you makes know, a difference, right? That can make a big difference. So, yeah. All right. So, uh, Frank. White Glove has taken a different... I'm just going to ask this last question. Um, White Glove has taken a different approach to doing seminars. Why do you think White Glove's so unique in that fashion? I mean, I, I've talked to White Glove probably two, three times, and I've engaged with them, and we've actually got some tough stuff, some things on the books now. And um, I think, you know... Because they're doing it differently, that makes them unique. But 
they're doing things in the advisor space that is really, really, really dynamic. Um, because you, 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 you pay for a good seat, right? You pay for, for pay for people to show up and now you're paying, you're betting on yourself because you're betting on your ability and your ability to perform on command. Right. And so you're betting on that. And so why do you think there's the white glove is like at the forefront of, of, of kind of that industry right now? I, I, I think it's for a couple of reasons. First, I think they kind of invented the digital marketing model. And I don't, I don't pretend to understand how to do digital. I mean, I, I struggle with Facebook and LinkedIn and all that stuff, but they've kind of mastered digital marketing. And so they know how to get people into the room. They will fill the room. And my, my, my philosophy is if you put me in front of 30 or 40 people, I am going to do business with 20 of them. So I don't care how much it costs me. I really don't. I mean, anything they do is going to be cheap if you can close 50%. I mean, that that's the trick. We started, a, my coaching starts at a 50% appointment ratio. If you're not at a 50% appointment ratio consistently, then you, you're you doing something wrong. You need help because those people want help and you should be much more successful than that. But White Glove, I think um, their model was the first to really say, we're not going to charge you for, for mail. We're going to charge you for success. Again, butts in the seats or you don't pay, which struck me as like mind boggling. I, I kept thinking, God, if that was around when I was doing seminars, I, I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. So that was the first thing. Then the second thing is they help. They really do. They, they, you know, they've got coaches like me. I'm not the only coach they've got. They've got some really good people who will help you. Um, and we want you to be successful. I mean, White Glove wants advisors to succeed with this, not just because they want repeat business, which is obvious, but because we're we're teaching 200 million Americans how to survive, right? I mean, when you think of seminars, financial advisors have a job here that is so big and so important that without us as an industry and as a profession, 240 million Americans will not make it financially. There, there's 240 million people out there, including some of the baby boomers, because. They're still dealing with baby boomers, but now you got Gen X, you got Gen Y, you got the millennials. They're all coming, okay? And they all need financial help. Without financial advisors, they're all going to die financially. I mean, you know, let's not be too dramatic about it. But I mean, the, the point is, they need us. We are the most necessary profession for the next hundred years. It's the greatest place to be in the world. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, that's powerful. Well, well Suzanne, that's. Uh... Frank said it best, you know. Uh, I'm not sure I could. He should have closed today. I know. <laughs> hey, like, hey, yeah, yeah. We've done. should have closed. Should've closed, should've closed that today. lightning bolt. We should probably move to our lightning round, right? Let's, 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 go, let's, move, round. let's move to the lightning round. I'm looking at the time. Um, Frank, do you have anything else to say before we go to the lightning round? Um, thank you so much for the work you're doing, coaching um, individuals and helping them become better versions of themselves so they could be better for their clients. Uh, we well, appreciate you and the work you're doing with White Glove and also your coaching, offering your services and offering your skill set and your years of knowledge to advisors. And, and and that's something that that is worth hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars because, you know, we don't know how long we have that information. So thank you for memorializing it in some books and manuals where we can go back and read it for the future. And our young advisors will thank you in the future. So. Cool. Well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate what you guys are doing because I, I think, um, you know, our profession is a really, really great profession and we need advocacy. We need somebody speaking for us and helping us uh, to prevent some stupidity coming out of our our elected leadership here. So I'm very, very happy of the, about what you're doing and I'm happy to be a part of it. I'll, I'll help in any way I can. Any NAFA people want to work, you just, just reach out to me. You get some special special treatment. All right. Perfect. All right. So Frank, here's what we do. The, the final round is, uh, we fire off some questions to you. Um, and, 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 and they may Google you and say, okay, I know who Frank is, but this is a way for them to really get to know you as a person. Okay. Mm -hmm. And whatever the answer is, that is the answer. And you don't have to overthink it. So it's not okay. something that like, we're going to ask you, you know, <laughs> an arithmetic, an arithmetic problem that, you know, they, they taught you and, you know, oh, you know, we're not going to do that. 
Um, so uh, we'll start off with questions that we know you know the answer to. Um, so so tell us, um, uh, what's your favorite food, Frank? Pizza. 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 Where are you, <laughs> where are you, where are you from? Where, where it was are you? fast, yeah. Uh, Frank, where are you from? Staten Island, New York. Oh, hence the Suzanne, pizza. He's, 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 he's New Yorkers. All right, Frank. So, so, so now, see, Frank, you knew the answer to that. You didn't have to think about it, right? Um, so, Frank, your favorite movie? Oh God, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Oh, that's, that's always a classic, that's especially a classic. for anyone. <laughs> what what not to do? <laughs> that is, you can't go wrong with that because coffee's for closers. Right? Right. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Someone said, you know, I, I'm, I, you know, it's funny. Someone said to me one day, they go, you know what? I've been in sales my entire career, and I said. I said to him at the end of the interview, I said, you know what, coffee's for closers. He goes, I've never heard that before. I go, oh. you're not a, you're not a, you're not a salesman. I'm sorry. It's just, yeah, that was one of the oldest, <laughs> oldest things ever. <laughs> All right. No. <laughs> All right. Your proudest moment in the business. Oh, God. Um, branch manager for uh, one of the largest branches at a major wirehouse. Um, I was a manager for a pain, company called Payne Weber. Just yeah. absolutely the number one branch in the country for Ben Weber. Very, very oh. proud of those folks. Huh. If I was starting in the industry right now today, what are the three things that you would tell me to focus on? Mm. Marketing, uh, psychology. That's part of my background as well. And... Um, Partnerships, strategic partnerships. That's good. That's good. That good. You're from New York, so I got to ask the question: um, the Yankees or the Mets? Neither. Not, not, a, not a baseball not a fan either. at all. <laughs> not a Giants fan. Not a football fan. I, 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 I am very fickle when it comes to sports. I was a major Patriots fan because. Running a fun family in Boston, we we hired Bill Belichick to come speak to our company, and so I was a Pats fan for a long, long time. But I'm very fickle. I'm a Patrick Mahomes devotee right now, so I'm looking forward to Kansas City in the Super. Does that Bowl. mean if you're fickle? Okay, you're well, that was, that was, well, that was well, that was well, that was the last that was our last question. Right, this yeah. is the pre. This is this is what our pre Super Bowl extravaganza. So we're going to ask the question: Who's going to win the Super Bowl? The Chiefs. Or the 49ers? Great, great question. Two fantastic teams, but I don't think we, we've ever seen anyone like a Mahomes um, and, and even a Tom Brady as great as he was. Uh, and Mahomes has a little long way to go there because it's longevity, not just, just immediate success. I don't think we've ever seen a phenomenon like this, this kid, Patrick Mahomes. I think the Chiefs will win, and um, I think they know how to win. I think they've got the attitude of a winner. And I think his spirit, his positive energy, and you, and if you know this kid, and he's a kid for God's sake, he's so young, um, he's an extremely positive force, and I think that's that's why they won yesterday, and that's why they will win in the Super Bowl. I, I could be wrong, but I, I think they deserve to win. You don't, you don't think Kelsey, or, Taylor Swift have a little extra? Well, <laughs> having Taylor Swift as your girlfriend is never a bad strategy for success. <laughs> So there's some positive motivation on that end as well. But, uh, yeah, no, I think they're a great team. It's going to be a good game. I think both teams are pretty good. Uh, I'm excited for both of them. I have to tell okay. you, I'll tell you quickly, as a mother who had two, uh, raised two two sons who both played football, I, t I really actually hope that the Taylor Swift piece of it actually brings football into many other mothers' lives and they actually don't try to get rid of it because there's always a threat to try to get rid of contact sports and uh, I hope that they can embrace that. And we understand that's one of America's great treasures is, is American style football. So I'll just put that little plug in there because both my kids learned a ton from it and it's a great sport. Yeah. I agree. All right, Frank, last question for you. Again. Your favorite quote. Oh gosh. Um, it's a poem called Invictus. It's not really a quote per se. Uh, I could recite the entire thing for you from memory, but it's a, it's a poem that, um, speaks to the character of human endurance. Uh, I don't think there's anything that human beings can't accomplish if we have the right attitude. So um, I'm a big believer in, in attitude and uh, approach to life. 
but uh, it's not it's not a simple quote. If you don't, if you know the poem Endurance, no, Captain My Soul, Invictus. Did I say? Invictus. I didn't mean to say Endurance. Invictus. You said Invictus. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's um, it's really uh, awe inspiring as far as I can tell. So Suzanne, you do know, um, Frank. Thank you so much. So Suzanne, you do know that that is the last thing you learn in Lily as you read. In that. Lily, yeah. In Lily, the leadership in life, which is a which is a NAFA, an exclusive, NAFA. Uh, leadership in life course and it's offered through your your local napa channel those who are out there are and lily members but you can learn leadership in life and they go through uh specific they tie it to movies they tie it to uh books and reading and one of the last things is the character of man and invictus and uh so thanks frank you we could ask you for a better lily uh (laughs) wow better lily plug (laughs) <laughs> so I'm a now. I am a NAFA natural. I really am. I belong in this organization. You are a NAFA natural. You are a NAFA natural. You found you found yes. your family, Frank. You found that. Thank family. you guys. Thank you. All right, uh, Frank. Any parting words before I close this out? No, no. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, if you need anything else, just reach out to me anytime. I'm here, and I live in North Carolina. It's nice and warm, and happy to help in any way I can. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Suzanne. Sir. Anything else you or anything else before we close out? <laughs> Excuse me. Uh no, I'm caught up in emotion from Frank here. No, I just I love the data natural. I'm gonna just keep on that. We have so many people that we find them and they're like, Yeah, you're our people and they find us and they're they're happy to come on home. So thank you for belonging, Frank. And thank all of you as I close this out today. Thank all of you for participating and listening to Advisors Today's podcast, our pre-Super Bowl edition uh, with Frank Fazelli. And uh, if you have an interest in working with White Glove and or being coached by Frank, you got the information here. And thank all of you for tuning in today. Again, NAFA Advisors Today's podcast is for the uplift of the education, uplifting and empowerment of all of us collectively as a whole and making us all better advisors for tomorrow. We'll see you next time on Advisor Today's podcast. See you. Thanks for joining us for NAPA's Advisor Today podcast series. Make sure to subscribe to get future episodes. And if you're interested in coming on the show, let us know.